One of the themes of the course, maybe the main theme of the course, is the diversities of early Christianity. In fact, a lot of scholars like to talk about not Christianity in the first 100 years, but Christianities. There's, this is one of the themes also of Bart Ehrman's textbook, so you should have picked up on this. There's lots of different kinds of Christianities, and we'll be talking about those kinds. Right. Today, we get to one of the most interesting differences to most people because most modern people are not at all familiar with the Gospel of Thomas. And so this, the Gospel of Thomas, not in our canon uh, uh, for several reasons, but we can talk about that at some point at the end of the lecture if you want to know. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas has become very famous, though, in the 20th, last part of the 20th century because it was rediscovered and published and it's created something of a sensation. According to the tradition, according to the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus had a twin brother. And his name was Didymus Judas Thomas. Now, Didymus is simply the Greek word for twin. Uh, it's also used as the Greek word for testicles, for obvious reasons. There are usually two of them. So Didymus is the Greek word for twin. And Thomas is from a Semitic word, either Hebrew or Aramaic or Syriac, which are all three similar languages. Uh, Thomas would look like twin in those. So the, the guy's name is Judas. The Hebrew version would be Judah. The Greek word would be Judas. And the English version is Jude. So you sometimes see it in English translations, Didymus, Jude, Thomas. But it's the same word, Judah or Judas. So his real name is Judah or Judas. And his Didymus and Thomas are his nicknames, one Greek and one uh, Semitic or Aramaic. He was the twin brother of Jesus, according to early Christian tradition. Now, just one strand of early Christian tradition, that is Thomasine Christianity, the forms of Christianity popular especially in Syria and the East, which traced their existence back to the Apostle Thomas. So there really was an Apostle Thomas among the 12 of Jesus' disciples, and, and, uh, and, and having the nickname twin. Uh, traditional, more, traditional Orthodox Christians don't believe he was Jesus' twin brother, they just believe that he had the nickname twin because he was somebody else's twin brother. But in Thomasine Christianity, he was connected to Jesus himself as Jesus' twin. According to some forms of Eastern Christianity, therefore, especially the early forms in Syria, Mesopotamia, and India, and yes, there was very, very early forms of Christianity in the west coast of India, they, and if you meet a Sir, an Indian person who's from that part of India and who considers themselves Christian, and they've been Christian for generations and generations, they will tell you, yes, Thomas was the apostle who brought the gospel to India the first time. So there are ancient traditions about this, and modern C uh, Indian Christians uh, still uh, trace their, their, their church back to the apostle Thomas. There are all kinds of Thomas literature from the ancient world. It's, a, it's, it's not all alike. It doesn't all represent one kind of Christianity or one church or even one region. But among, besides the Gospel of Thomas, we know of the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. This is a wonderful little document. If you took my historical Jesus class, you get to read the fragments of the Infancy Gospel of Thomas that we still have. And it shows Jesus, everybody wonders, well, what was Jesus like as a kid? You know, what games did he play? Did he play cops and robbers? Did he play with dolls? You know, what did Jesus do as a kid? Well, Thomas tells you. It tells you, for example, that he made a bunch of clay pigeons, and when this uh, Jew, it's kind of an anti-Jewish document, this Jew comes up to him and says, you're not supposed to be doing that on the Sabbath, so Jesus claps his hands and the pigeons all fly off. The clay pigeons fly off. Or when one of his uh, buddies, uh, uh, get, that he gets mad as one of his buddies, so he uh, strikes the kid dead, and then has to raise the kid up again. Uh, when one of his teeth... When one of his teachers criticizes him, he says, what do you know, you bimbo, and strikes the teacher dumb and blind or something. You know? So Jesus as a little kid in the Gospel of Thomas, in the, the infancy Gospel of Thomas, is kind of a little rat, but um, that's the way people imagined him as a child. So there's the infancy Gospel of Thomas, there's the Acts of Thomas, which are very interesting. Thomas comes across as very anti-marriage, anti-family. There's the Hymn of the Pearl, or the hymn, as it's also called, the hymn of Jude Thomas the Apostle in the country of the Indians. Same document. We tend to call it the hymn of the pearl. There's uh, the book of Thomas, the contender writing to the perfect. So all of these different texts sprang up in early Christianity, most of them in the second century, 
The second century was a time of a lot of Christian literature arising in different places that didn't make it into the Bible. Before the discovery, though, of the Nag Hammadi codices, and you probably already know how to spell Nag Hammadi because you've seen it in your textbook, it's just the name of a village in modern Egypt. I don't remember how many I's and D's and M's and D's it has, but it's something like that. That's that right? Dylan, uh, who is our, one of our teaching assistants, he's an expert on all this stuff, so he can correct me. Uh, Nag Kamadi is a village in Egypt, and in 1945, while they were digging for some clay and that sort of thing, uh, some uh, Egyptian peasant found a, uh, 13 large books. Remember the, the word codex or codices, I talked about in the, uh, one of the early lectures, means the kind of book that has, the pa has pages and all sewn up on one side to distinguish it from a book that's in a scroll form. So this, by this time he found these books. They had been buried there probably sometime in the 4th century, so in the 300s, and they'd probably been hidden there because that's about the time that certain forms of Christianity were being outlawed and declared heretical. There are 13 of these big books, and right, it's right along the Nile River, and we call these the Nag Hammadi Library or the Nag Hammadi Corpus, the Nag Hammadi text. That's just because the modern village near where they were found is Nag Hammadi. Before this 1945 discovery, and the Gospel of Thomas is one of many, many different texts that were discovered in this library of material. Before this, we knew that there was a Gospel of Thomas because early Christian writers would talk about it, usually to condemn it. And we, did, we had a few papyrus fragments, three papyrus fragments, that had Greek versions of just parts of the Gospel of Thomas, just pieces of it, from Oxyrhynchus, Egypt. But the Nag Hammadi discovery was really a very, very exciting because it greatly increased our knowledge of some forms of Christianity that the only thing we had known about them was by Orthodox uh, writers condemning it. And you know, when Orthodox, when one kind of writer is condemning another uh, bunch of people, you can't necessarily trust what they say. Orthodox writers, for example, claimed that Gnostics, who they took to be these, these heretics, they were, we will talk about Gnosticism in this lecture, they said, oh, they have these wild sex orgies and they, uh, they drink blood and they have cannibalism. Well, uh, regular Christians were accused by their enemies of doing precisely the same thing. So we don't believe everything, but when we found these Nag Hammadi texts, we had sort of first-hand texts from these people who understood Christianity differently than what would come to be um, Orthodox Christianity. Now, the modern study of Gnosticism, uh, therefore, has been completely revolutionized by this study because it brought to light a complete version of the Gospel of Thomas, although it was in Coptic translation of the Greek. It was originally written in Greek, translated into Coptic, which is an ancient Egyptian language. But it also br brought to light all these other texts, not all by the same people, not all reflecting the same views. Some of them, for example, are just pieces of Plato or parts of the Bible and that sort of thing. These texts, as I said, were the, the texts we actually have, the Nag Hammadi Codices, were, were written around the time 350. And we know this because the cardboard that was used to bind these things was made out of papyrus fragments and paper fragments. They were older. So by, by dating some of the, the, the pieces of paper that were used to make the cardboard that bound these things, we can tell when the, at least these books were put together. Um, but we think that a lot of these texts were actually written in the second century, and the Gospel of Thomas, most scholars would say, is written before the year 200. Some scholars believe that the Gospel of Thomas goes all the way back to the first century and may even be as early as Mark or Q or even earlier. I think probably the majority of scholars don't believe that. I think the majority of us believe that the Gospel of Thomas was probably first written in Greek uh, in the first half of the second century, so it's between 100 and 150. But we don't really know. It's a, just a complete guess. Some of the sayings in the Gospel of Thomas um, look actually older. Bart Ehrman talks about why you would think a certain a saying in one form might be older than a saying in another form, uh, and that's debatable. But some of us, if we just compare the sayings side by side, those in the Gospel of Thomas, to some people would say, well, this looks actually like an older version of this saying or of Jesus, or an older version of a, of a parable of Jesus that we find in Matthew or Mark. And so some people have said, and even if the Gospel of Thomas itself comes from the second century, it may well contain what are more ancient versions of sayings of Jesus. 
This is why when people do historical Jesus research, that is, trying to figure out from the multiple Gospels that we have, what did the historical Jesus really say and really do, historically determined, people will use the Gospel of Thomas sometimes to say, well, this is actually more likely what Jesus actually, cl close to what Jesus actually said, and the canonical Gospel writers have edited it up a bit. So that's, it's very debatable about that, but that's uh, part of the value of the Gospel of Thomas is that for a lot of scholars, we believe it takes us back at least to close to the time of Jesus in some of its sayings, but not necessarily in all of its sayings. There are 114 sayings, as you by now know in the Gospel of Thomas, and as I said last time, scholars like to use two-bit words when one-bit words would do just as well. So instead of calling these sayings, you will often see them called logia. That's the plural. Logion is the singular. Logion is just Greek for a saying. So logia is just Greek for sayings. So often in scholarship, in your textbook, sometimes it'll say logion 114 from the Gospel of Thomas. And that just means saying 114. There are 114 of them. And in fact, they're introduced, the Gospel is introduced by just the words, these are the obscure or the hidden sayings that the living Jesus uttered and which Didymus, Jude, Thomas wrote down. So it gives you sort of this little title right there at the beginning. Notice, there's no passion narrative. There's no description of the death of Jesus. There's no resurrection. And actually most people think that Jesus speaks as if he's already been resurrected. So does this author intend us to think that this is the post-resurrection Jesus? Or did he just assume that even in, before his death, Jesus just talked this way? You have to use your imagination because the author doesn't really tell us much. Now, comparisons with other Gospels. Get out your text, your uh, Gospel of Thomas, and read with me through some of these things. Look at Logion 9. This is the parable of the sower. Jesus said, listen, a sower came forth, took a handful, and cast. Now some fell on from the pathway, and the birds came and picked them out. Others fell on a rock, but they did not take root in the soil and did not send up ears. Others fell upon the thorns, and they choked the seed, and the grubs devoured them. And others fell upon good soil, and it sent up good crops, and yielded 60 per measure and 120 per measure. That's actually an example of when you have a saying that sounds um, more primitive, perhaps, in this gospel, because notice how that saying is shorter and a bit simpler than the same parable would be in either Matthew or Luke, an example of why some people say, well, maybe it's more primitive. That one sounds very, very much like what you've got already in the canonical gospel, so it should sound familiar to you. Look at the number eight right above that. What human beings resemble is an intelligent fisherman who, having cast his net into the sea, pulled up the net out of the sea full of little fish. The intelligent fisherman, upon finding among them a fine large fish, threw all the little fish back into the sea, choosing without any effort the big fish. Whoever has ears to hear should listen. Now this translation, I'm reading from Bentley Layton's translation. He's a professor in our department. He's uh, very famous as one of the top coptologists in the world. And so I'm using his translation of this. Uh, and, but that whoever has ears to hear should listen, even though the translation makes it sound slightly different, that's just exactly the same thing as you see in the Gospels. Let him who have ears to hear, hear. Leighton just decided to translate it in a bit more colloquial English version. So that's just like what you would find practically in the other Gospels. Look in 30, saying 30. Jesus said, where there are three divine beings, they are divine. Where there are two or one, I myself dwell with that person. That sounds a bit more odd, doesn't it? It sounds a bit like a saying of Jesus in the Gospels that says, wherever two or three are gathered together, I am there in the midst of them. But what is this about divine beings? Where there are three divine beings, they are divine. Where there are two or one, I myself dwell with that person. It's a puzzle. You can tell how it's similar, but not exactly like the, the synoptic Gospels. Look at saying 48. Jesus said, if two make peace with one another within a single house, they will say to a mountain, go elsewhere, and it will go elsewhere. Does anybody remember what the synoptic version of that saying says? Anybody know your Bible well enough? Yes, sir? Uh, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell a mountain to move and it will go. That's right. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, the size of a mustard seed, you can tell a mountain to remove itself and it'll go. So it's a it's in this this thing about um, to making peace 
again, uh, with one ag another within a house. So the, it's the peacemaking that seems to give the power. Um, 86. Jesus said, foxes have their dens and birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head and gain repose. Now that sounds funny. Up until the last couple of words, it sounded just like the Synoptic Gospels, but this, at least Leighton is translated, in, and it doesn't just say, and get rest, and, and rest, lay his head and rest. Professor Leighton has, for some reason, translated this to sound a bit odd, and gain repose. I think what that means is he's trying to signal that this, these last two words have some kind of special meaning for this author in this text. What kind of special meaning would that be? And then 113. These are just examples of sayings that look very much like what we already have seen in the Bible. His disciples said to him, when is the kingdom going to come? Now we've got this in the Gospels also in the Bible. Jesus said, it is not by being waited for that it's going to come. They are not going to say, here it is, or there it is. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out over the earth, and people do not see it. This is not the kingdom coming in the future, as we've seen it in Mark and Matthew and Luke. This is the kingdom is already here around the earth. And if you don't know that, it's just because you aren't recognizing it. There are, though, really interesting peculiarities of the Gospel of Thomas, and let's look at some of those. First, look at 13. These are some sayings that look more odd to us. Jesus said to his disciples, compare me to something and tell me what I resemble. This is starting off sounding like what we've seen already. Simon Peter said, a just angel is whom you resemble. Matthew said to him, an intelligent philosopher is what you resemble. Thomas said to him, teacher, my mouth utterly will not let me say what you resemble. Jesus said, I am not your teacher for you. Now notice he, Leighton's letting you know, are you using the same translation that I am? That's right, I thought I gave you the same translation. Leighton says, lets you know because you can't tell in English whether that your teacher is singular you or plural you, and he tells you it's singular in the Coptic. I am not your teacher, so Jesus is directing this not to all the apostles, but to Thomas in particular, right here. For you have drunk and become intoxicated from the bubbling wellspring that I have personally measured out. Well, what the hell does that mean? And he took him, that is, took Thomas, withdrew, and said three things to him. Now when Thomas came to his companions, they asked him, what did Jesus say to you? Thomas said to them, if I say to you, plural, one of the things that he said to me, you will take stones and stone me, and fire will come out of the stones and burn you up. Sort of an ancient version of, I'd tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. Look at 29. Jesus said, it is amazing if it was for the spirit that flesh came into existence. And it is amazing indeed if spirit came into existence for the sake of the body. But as for me, I am amazed at how this great wealth has come to dwell in this poverty. What does that mean? Look at the very last saying. I hope some of you noticed this when you were reading over this before you came to class. Simon Peter said to them, Mary should leave us. He's talking about Mary Magdalene, probably. For females are not worthy of life. Jesus said, See, I am going to attract her to make her male, so that she too might become a living spirit that resembles you males. For every female that makes itself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Look at 24. I'm just picking out some sayings that are rather mysterious. His disciples said, show us the place where you are, for we must seek it. He said to them, whoever has ears should listen. There is light existing within a person of light, and it enlightens the whole world. If it does not enlighten, that person is darkness. The previous saying had this duality of male and female that was somehow significant in some mysterious way. This one shows us there's, there's a, also a duality of concern to this author of light and darkness. So there's dualisms, and especially a light-darkness dualism, male-female dualism, and a soul-body dualism. We've already seen that. Uh, there's also this word that Leighton translates as the entirety, and some modern translations will just leave it, they'll just transliterate the Greek that it's from, pleroma. 
pleroma is a Greek word that comes important in some philosophy in the ancient world, in some intellectual, and it just means the all or the fullness. But it comes, it's an abstract word meaning full or fullness, but it comes to be some kind of technical term that refers to, I don't know, all of existence or the fullness of being, or like think of German philosophy with fullness with a cap, being with a capital B, or existence with a capital E. So that word is often occurs here, and when you see the word entirety in Leighton's translation, he's translated that, that word pleroma. Jesus said, and this is 67, if anyone should become acquainted with the entirety, the pleroma, and should fall short at all, that fall person falls short utterly. Several other places, saying 77 has another reference to that. Notice we've already seen that this text does not take the kingdom of God as something existing in the future. In fact, this text is not at all eschatological. Remember we encountered this word in a previous lecture, which just means something having to do with the end, eschaton in Greek meaning the end. This author is not eschatological. He doesn't think Christianity, he doesn't think Jesus' teachings are about the future at all. They're about now, they're about the present. So there are several sayings in Thomas, unlike the sayings in the Gospels, in the canon, that are not eschatological. They very much point to the present. There's also something else. One of this, this, uh, this author is concerned about something like integration. Look at saying 61. Jesus said, two will repose on a couch, one will die, one will live. Salome said, who are you, O man? Like a stranger, you have gotten up on my couch and you have eaten from my table. Jesus said to her, it is I who come from that which is integrated. I, I come from that which is one. I come from that which is not divided. I was given some of the things of my father. She apparently, there's a lot of holes in the text where you see those dot, dot, dots, and that's showing that there are lacunae, that is just holes in the, in the actual um, document that, Leighton, that we get this from. So there are gaps in the text. I am your female disciple, she seems to say to him at some point. And then eventually he seems to answer, therefore I say that such a person, once integrated, will become full of light. But such a person, once divided, will become full of darkness. So there's a divided, integrated dualism that's going on in this text also. Uh, the kingdom is invisible. I think I've already pointed this out. The idea is that the kingdom is not something you say, look, it's over there, or look, it's here. Uh, 113, I've already read that. Uh, the kingdom of the Father is spread out over the earth, but most people don't see it. And then look at saying three, right at the very beginning. Jesus said, if those who lead you say to you, see, the kingdom is in heaven, then the birds of heaven will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. But the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you become acquainted with yourself, now the word acquainted here means when you become really knowledgeable, and it comes from, the Greek word here is gnosis, where we get the term Gnostics. That Greek word means gnosis, but it, does, it means gnosis in, a, in, a, in some kinds of a technical way in these documents, which is, it's not something you just know with your head. It's something you really, really know. And so to express that, uh, Professor Layton usually translates this word as acquaintance, or becoming acquainted with it. When you become acquainted with yourselves, then you will be recognized, and you will understand that it is you who are children of the living Father. But if you do not become acquainted with yourself, if you don't have gnosis of yourself, then you are in poverty, and it is you who are the poverty. What is all this going on? These things are things that sound a bit familiar, and we might be able to figure them out because these are themes. You can tell that there are things of light and darkness, poor and riches, uh, inside and out, soul and body, spirit and body, uh, male and female. But there are some sayings that are just really inscrutable. Look at saying seven. Jesus said, blessed is the lion that the human being will devour so that the lion becomes human. And cursed is the human being that the lion devours and the lion will become human. What does that mean? I have no clue. And that's really honest. Look at 15. Jesus said, 
when you, and here's a plural you, see one who has not been born of woman, fall upon your faces and prostrate, your, prostrate yourselves before that one, it is that one who is your father. Someone not born of women is your father. 97. Now, you see, aren't you glad that I didn't make you do an exegesis paper of these sayings? Jesus said, what the kingdom of the Father resembles is a woman who was conveying a jar full of meal. When she had traveled far along the road, the hand of the jar broke, and the meal spilled out after her along the road. She was not aware of the fact. She had not understood how to toil. When she reached home, she put down the jar and found it empty. How profound, Jesus. <laughs> she lost her meal, and she found her jar empty when she got home. Okay, 98, right below that. <clears throat> Jesus said, what the kingdom of the Father resembles is a man who wanted to assassinate a member of court. At home, he drew the dagger and stabbed it into the wall in order to know whether his hand would be firm. Next, he murdered the member of court. <laughs> That's what the kingdom is like. Now you know exactly what the kingdom is like, right? 105. Jesus said, whoever is acquainted with the father and the mother will be called the offspring of a prostitute. <laughs> All right, what's going on here? This document has caused and still causes all kinds of debate among scholars. You could go online right now and you will see tons and tons and tons of stuff written about the Gospel of Thomas, some by real scholars and intelligent, wise people like me, although I've actually never written about the Gospel of Thomas because I don't want to go that, get in that mess. But I have good scholarly friends who publish on the Gospel of Thomas and argue their theories. Others by just absolute kooks <clears throat> who are using the Gospel of Thomas for all kind of experimental spirituality and religion and, you know, mind stuff. I'm trying to watch my language. So, but then you'll also have, even if you took very reputable scholars you will have wide differences of opinion. And one of the big differences of opinion right now, when, when the Gospel of Thomas first became published, people were sort of talking about it as, oh, this is a Gnostic Gospel. It represents a form of Gnosticism, which I'll explain in a moment. Other people have said, no, it's not Gnostic. It doesn't have all the main things that we look for. In fact, they've even said, we shouldn't even use this term Gnosticism anymore because it doesn't refer to anything we can actually locate in the ancient world. It refers to a whole bunch of different things, and nobody can come up with a good definition of Gnosticism or the Gnostic Church. So scholars right now, some scholars will say, let's get rid of the term entirely and call it something else, whatever it is this thing is. Others continue to use the term. Bart Ehrman wrote your textbook, if you'll notice. He goes ahead and sort of takes the Gospel of Thomas as representing some kind of Gnosticism, um, but maybe not all of whatever would be called Gnosticism, and he admits that there's a big debate. Now I'm going to, uh, a little bit of terminology. I've already told you what Gnost, the term Gnostic comes from this word gnosis, and the word Gnosticos was used by some people in the ancient world to refer to themselves, but they didn't necessarily mean by that that they were in some kind of sect called Gnosticism. For example, Clement of Alexandria, who wrote around the year 200, a very famous uh, early Christian scholar considered by later Christianity to be perfectly orthodox, he talked about Gnostic Christians and thought he was himself a Gnostic Christian. And what he meant by that apparently was just that he was one of the more knowledgeable. He was one of the more wise Christians. He was in the know. And he seems also to have had an idea that there were two kinds of Christian knowledge. There's public knowledge that all Christians have, and then there's special kind of hidden knowledge, esoteric knowledge, that only certain kinds of Christians have. And so this idea that you have esoteric knowledge would be called a Gnostic kind of notion. So there are even Orthodox uh, Christians who might use the term Gnostic in the second century to refer even to themselves. So that's just what that word, the word Gnostic often meant. It would have looked a bit weird to an ancient Greek speaker, but it would, have been, uh, it would have been understandable as simply a knowing person. There are other terms, though, that I, I want to talk about. I've already mentioned, I believe, the term proto-Orthodox. The word orthodox, of course, just means right thinking, right opinion. Ortho, from Greek, right, or true, or correct, or straight. Doxa, meaning opinion, or thoughts, or, or then it comes to mean doctrine, too. The problem with using the word orthodox is that the opposite of orthodox is usually heresy. 
in this, and in eventually, uh, through different church councils in the 4th and 5th and 6th centuries, what counted as Orthodox Christianity became more clearly defined, and then anything that wasn't that could be labeled heretical Christianity, and it was even outlawed at different times in late antiquity. So, for example, the Nicene Creed that proclaims that the, Trin the doctrine of the Trinity becomes Orthodox. Doctrines that say that the Trinity is not true or that uh, there's not the Holy Spirit and, and Jesus and the Father are not Orthodox. They're heretical or sometimes you'll see the term heterodox. Hetero just means other. So it's, it's not ortho, it's other. So Orthodox, though, the problem is we can't retroject that term easily back into the second century because in the second century the, there are tons of different Christians and tons of different churches that had many different views and they didn't all agree. For there, some people had, were sort of experimenting with the doctrine of the Trinity, but a lot of Christians wouldn't have recognized the doctrine of the Trinity in the second century. Some people believe that Jesus was fully divine. Other believes that people believe, no, he was fully human but not divine. Some people believed he was both. Some people believe he was a mixture of both. Some believe that sometimes he was one, sometimes he was the other. We'll come back to this issue of, of, of what did people believe Jesus was, and that's the doctrine of Christology. What do you believe about Christ? But right now I'm just going to tell you that the pro we, call, we call Christians in the sec second century and the first century proto-Orthodox because we, don't, we know that calling them Orthodox is anachronistic, in this time because there wasn't a two clearly delineable orthodox and heretical uh, groups or churches. We, proto just means earlier than or the first. So a lot of scholars, Bart Ehrman is one of them, uses this term proto-orthodox and all it means is those Christians living in the first or second century who, whose views happened to win out eventually. They happened to hold views that would eventually be uh, the winners in the fight between orthodoxy and heresy and be declared orthodox or correct Christianity. So proto-orthodox, there, there was no Christian running around in the second century calling himself a proto-orthodox Christian. They didn't know they were proto-orthodox yet, they, but their views eventually won out. So these different terms will come over and over again. Proto-orthodox just means someone who sort of had correct Christological views, that is correct by later standards, but they held them before these standards had won out in the debate. Ancient Gnosticism, if you want to call it that, does not seem to have been one church. What I'm going to call Gnosticism is an intellectual movement that seems to have been around beginning in the second century, certainly, and becomes important through the second, third, and fourth centuries. It's not a church or an institution in the sense that we doubt that you could have walked into, say, the town of Antioch and looked for the, the Gnostic church. It seems like w the people who wrote these documents and collected these materials that we find in the Nag Hammadi text and the Gospel of Thomas, they seem to have been intellectuals who were impressed with Jesus, impressed with the uh, Jewish scripture in a lot of cases, impressed with a lot of the teachings of Christianity, but they interpreted them through the eyes of a certain popular Platonism at the time. That is, they seem to have been influenced by different philosophical views, and also just different intellectual views. So when they read the, the book of Genesis, for example, they would read the book of Genesis, but read it as if they were reading it through the eyes of Plato's Timaeus, the great Platonic dialogue in which Plato puts forth his own sort of uh, cosmology and his own view of, of the gods and uh, the world. So it sound, some of their writings sound like they were reading basically good scripture, but reading it through the eyes of certain kinds of philosophy. And so what we've come to call Gnosticism in the ancient world is a range of ideas that may have been actually embodied in particular people, or it may have been that some of these just intellectuals were just playing around with ideas and writing them up in books and having reading clubs where they got together every Monday night you know, and drank some beer and uh, uh, talked about their Gnostic ideas. Platonism itself might be called proto-Gnostic, that is Gnosticism before Gnosticism. Uh, for example, in Platonism, especially at this time, you have a strong emphasis of a dualism of body and soul, or body and spirit. And in that dualism, often the body or the materiality, the fleshly existence, the harder matter of things, becomes less good, sometimes even probably bordering on evil in some people's thought, and spirit or the soul or the mind is the good thing. So you have a mind-body dualism, a, a body and soul dualism. And often there's a deprecation of the body and a deprecation of matter as morally inferior. 
Now, why would matter be considered inferior to non-material substance? Because uh, what happens to your body eventually? You all have gorgeous bodies now, but eventually you're going to look like me. Your hair is going to fall out, your ears are going to get too big, your nose won't stop growing, and then eventually you'll get even get beyond me and you'll die and you'll rot and you'll disappear. The body is material and the ancient thinkers all knew that matter passes away. Anything that is material is going to pass away and, and be destroyed and be gone. But things that are not material like ideas, an idea, the great thing about an idea is that it never need die. So the spirit of the soul in Platonic theory was superior to material stuff because, and it was the only thing that could live forever, be inf infinite. They also sometimes you see, especially in later Platonism, the idea that not only is the, is the body temporary, not eternal, and passing away, but the body is also a prison because your spirit, they believed, wants to get out of the body. Aren't you frustrated that you can't just escape your body and, and go off and go someplace else for a while and, and zoom out of your, your body and, and go to Argentina for the weekend? You know, not have to pay for airfare? Or, you know, so the idea was that the body imprisons your spirit and your soul. And this is, comes to be a part of Platonism at the time. So what scholars will call basic Gnosticism include some basic themes that they hold in common. First, the world itself, which is material, is evil. Salvation, therefore, from the world must be escape from this physical world into something else. Gross materiality is not only temporary in some texts, but even bad. It's evil. And salvation, therefore, must be the knowledge of how you, that is the real you, your brain, your, I mean not your brain, your mind or your soul or your spirit, not your body, that real you is existing in this material body, but salvation will be if it can learn how to escape the body and escape materiality. That not, salvation will become by knowledge, and that knowledge is a secret. Not everybody knows it. So only a few people know it. The content of this knowledge is related to human origins and destination. So sometimes you get this elab these elaborate myths developed in some of these texts. Let's say that the supreme, 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 supreme God is in fact has no name, is not a particular thing. It's this thought. It's just thinking. It's just abstract thinking. That thinking thinks. Well, what does the thinking thing think? The thinking thinks thoughts. Those thoughts start becoming emanations out of the thinking. And then those emanations think and emanate, and those become lesser beings still. And these, so the different divine beings, there are lots of divine beings that exist in the universe, and they th by thinking and being, they emanate inferior forms of being after themselves. And eventually, what happened is those inferior forms of being get less good and less like the most ultimate being. And one of them, according to one myth, Sophia, which means wisdom, it's a female name, but it also means wisdom, Sophia decides she wants to emanate, and she's supposed to do that with a male consort, because by this time these beings have male and female versions of themselves. She's supposed to only emanate or procreate by doing so with her male consort. She decides she wants to be like the supreme god and be able to emanate on her own. So she puts out a being on her own. And for, in other words, she sort of gives birth without needing a man. Just the, the being principle. Well, of course, when you do that, you end up with a monster. So the being that came out of Sophia ended up being a clumsy, maybe evil god. These all these are divine beings. That god decided at some point he wanted to create things, and so he he didn't really do it very well. So he made our earth. He made the world as we know it. He made little human beings like you, just out of dirt and clay. And that's why you know we were we were all creation, not of the supreme god who would do nothing imperfect but of some stumbling or evil, at least clumsy God, who made us. That explains why you know, things go wrong. Why is it that my arthritis acts up all the time? Couldn't God have made a human body that didn't have arthritis? Well, that's because the supreme God didn't make this body. The evil, clumsy God made the body. This happened, and so the, the world that we created, when you read in Genesis that says God created the world, that's not the highest God. 
That's some clumsy God down further on the hierarchy of divine beings in the universe. That God created what we are. Now, what happened was at some point, either Sophia or some other beings, they got sorry for all of us clay-like mud, mud people. And somehow a little spark of the divine itself either fell down or got cut up or put in our bodies or God placed in our bodies or blew it into our bodies. But at least some human beings, not all human beings, in fact, human beings are in different categories. There's, you know, the really low human beings like undergraduates. Then there are beings who are a little bit higher like graduate students. And then you have the supreme beings, Gnostics, like professors. So the true Gnostics, so you, can, you don't ever, it's not really like undergraduates and graduate stuff, because some of you could be Gnostics. You would be the ones who really have a real spark in you, a spark of the divine. That spark of the divine wants to escape the mud body that it's trapped in. But you probably don't even know that you're really a spark trapped in a mud body until somebody comes along and tells you. And that's the job of the Redeemer. That's what Jesus did. Jesus was a Redeemer from the Supreme God who comes in to find those people who have a spark of the divine in them, to blow on that spark, to get it going, and to get you to remember where you came from. You're not a mud body after all. The real you came from God himself, God's very self, the Supreme God. So the true message of Christianity, according to these guys, is to learn who you are, where you came from, to, so you can escape the body and get back to your true origin. That is, you will become one with God again. And this was expressed in a poem by Theodotus. It went like this. Who we were, what we have become, where we were, whither we were thrown, whither we are hastening, from what we are redeemed, what birth is, what rebirth is. Okay, now you answer the riddle. It's a poem riddle. Who we were. If you're a Gnostic, who were you? Answer. Divine, Divine being. Thank you. See, it's not hard. I'm not answering questions. I'm just trying, you'll remember this better if you answer. What have you become? Mud, entrapped in a, a dead body, entrapped in materiality. Where were you? Heaven with the Divine Father, with God. Whither we were thrown, where have you been thrown? Into the earth, into the world, into materiality. Where are you hastening? Where are you going in, a hur in such a hurry? Back to the divine God. What are you redeemed from? You're redeemed from Jesus? The material world. You're redeemed from being embodied. Uh, what is birth? In this system, what is birth? Damnation. Damnation, death. When you're born, your spark is entrapped in your body. That's not a good thing. You shouldn't be celebrating your birthday for crying out loud. That's like celebrating when you were thrown in prison. And what is rebirth? Death, or learning your true self. Learning that you, the true self won't die at all. So this learning is your rebirth. So the little poem is a riddle that contains these doctrines uh, within itself. So here's the true self, the spark of light, is trapped in an alien body with all its sensual passions. Sex, therefore, sensual desire, erotic desire, is a bad thing, is an evil thing, because that, you're just trying to trap more sparks into more mud bodies. You're just creating more sparks trapped in mud bodies when you have sex. Evil powers exist, all, all the different gods that were emanated, a bunch of those are evil, and they fly around the sky and the heavens, and they, did, they try to keep the true self asleep or drunk in order to keep the evil world together. In other words, they don't want you to learn, and they don't want your spark to be able to fly through. But really wise guys, like me, we have the secrets, and I can give you words, clues, secrets, that you, if you know those things, you can use these secrets to unlock the gates that lead back to God. So uh, this is kind of a, a common storyline or myth. There's a hymn of the pearl that I mentioned before, which basically tells this, that a king of the east sends a royal prince by way of the region of Messene to Egypt in order to get a precious pearl, which is being guarded by a fierce dragon. Yeah, 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 it's like a, it's like a video game, right? The prince is poisoned, or actually drugged would be a better accurate translation, and made intoxicated by the Egyptians. But he, the prince, is awakened by a message from the king. 
he, the prince, takes the pearl by defeating the dragon with the name of his father and returns to the east where he puts on a robe of knowledge, gnosis, and ascends to the king palace, entering the realm of peace and living happily forever after. It's a nice little fable about a prince who goes to a foreign land, finds the thing of value, defeats the evil purposes, and goes back. So some people, therefore, have read the Gospel of Thomas as being precisely this kind of, uh, uh, that some of the sayings of the Gospel of Thomas make sense if you presuppose these mythological structures and ideas. And again, some scholars would say, well, you're just putting together, as a modern scholar, a bunch of disparate kind of texts and ideas and putting them in a system. Well, yes, that, that, that's where I disagree with some people because I want to say I believe that there's enough commonalities between enough documents that we can say that there are people who had these kinds of common ideas. And this basic structure that I've called the Gnostic structure, the Gnostic myth, certainly influenced ancient writings of some sort, and, it's, and there were some kinds of Christianity that were heavily influenced by this. So, for example, look at, back to Thomas for our last closing minutes, and let's read some of these sayings that sound puzzling to us, and if we, under, if we assume this myth, maybe we'll read them differently. Look at 21. <clears throat> Mary said to Jesus, What do your disciples resemble? He said, What they resemble is children living in a plot of land that is not theirs. When the owners of the land come, they will say, Surrender our land to us. They, for their part, strip naked in their presence in order to give it back to them, and they give them back their land. An alleg it could be an allegory. Who are the owners of the land? The evil powers that rule the earth. Who are the children? Who are the real disciples of Jesus? Those people who know enough to say, when the earth is demanded of you, when your body is demanded of you by these evil powers, give it up. Just give it. It It's not valuable anyway. Look at 24. His disciples said, show us the place where you are, for we must seek it. He said to them, whoever has ears should listen. There is a light existing within a person of light, and it enlightens the whole world. If it does not enlighten, that person is darkness. Remember how I said some people are just dark people? They're just mud people. But some people have a light in them, and what it means to become a true Gnostic is to, know, to learn that you are one who has that light. 37. His disciples said, when will you be shown forth to us, and when shall we behold you? Jesus said, When you strip naked without being ashamed, and take your garments, and put them under your feet, like little children, and tread upon them, then you will see the child of the living, and you will not be afraid. Okay, what's the Gnostic interpretation of that? Stripping the material world off yourself. When you strip your soul, your, sp your spark of the body, when you realize that it's not the real you, and you come to know the real you, that's what's going to happen. 56. Jesus said, whoever has become acquainted with the world has found a corpse, and the world is not worthy of the one who has found the corpse. The world is just a, a dead body. So all of these, there are several of the sayings, that if you go back through the Gospel of Thomas, with some of this background information I've given you of these ancient myths and ideas, some of these sayings seem to fit the, that myth and fit that notion. There are other things, though, about what I've just told you that you don't find in the Gospel of Thomas, and those are the things emphasized by people who say the Gospel of Thomas shouldn't be called Gnostic. For example, there's no mention in here of an evil God that creates the world, like you find in some of these Nag Hammadi texts. You have the Father, you have apparently the good God, you have Jesus, but there's, not, he, there's no emphasis on creation here as being a bad thing. So some people have said, that's, that's one of the fundamental things about the Gnostic myths, and it's not in the Gospel of Thomas, therefore the Gospel of Thomas is uh, not Gnostic. There are also simply no string of myths and evil gods' names, which you often find in the text of Nag Hammadi. So some scholars would say the Gospel of Thomas may have some things in common with Platonism of the time, maybe even something in common with certain Gnostics, but it itself is not. But if you take the Gospel of Thomas as representing those ideas, then Jesus comes across, the Christology of the Gospel of Thomas becomes something different from the Christology of the other texts, or at least Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As we'll see, the Gospel of John looks a lot more like this than the Synoptic Gospels did. But Jesus becomes this Redeemer figure, this Gnostic Redeemer figure who comes into the world of materiality in order to find those who have sparks of light 
to blow on their sparks of light, to transmit hidden knowledge to them so they can get back. And if you'll stay with me the rest of the semester, maybe I can give you those secrets and you can escape your mud bodies too. All right? You have your, your uh, sections this week. Uh, by tomorrow, they'll be up on, online at the classes server, inst uh, the different instructions for the rest of the sections. And you'll need to look at that because at your section on 30 or Friday, you'll need to choose which day and which topic you'll do your paper for. So that will be online by tomorrow morning. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>